Faith is a very important thing. I don't know if there's anything more important than faith, is there? Is there anything more important than faith? You can't please God without faith. That's right. We'd all be in hell without faith, wouldn't we? Well, let's look at faith. I'm going to read from Bullinger's uh, A Critical Lexicon and Concordance to the English and Greek New Testament, and actually it even goes a lot into the Hebrew also. Uh, Bullinger was a great mind. On page uh, 271 in his lexicon, he said, uh, now there's wor different words for faith, you know that. Uh, one word for faith, we could go back in the Old Testament first and uh, Habakkuk, uh, the, bo the book of Habakkuk. We have, uh, in 2 and verse 4, we have the just shall live by faith, okay? The just shall live by faith. And that word is imunah, or iman, or imun. Those are the words in Hebrew, which means to steadfastly believe. To believe even when you might think it's not possible to believe. Unlikely pillars of faith in the Bible. People that you would not think that were even capable of being a, what we might call a Christian or a believer. You would not think they were even capable of it. And yet, we see them. Remember in the New Testament where it says Lot, Lot vexed his righteous soul? Lot was a believer? Lot was a believer? Can you think of that? Lot was a believer. Let's read and see what Mr. Bullinger says of the word uh, pieces, first of all. It said, per firm persuasion, the conviction which is based upon hearing, not upon sight. Hearing means to hear and obey. Akuo is the word to hear, and akuo means to basically hear, obey, and follow. We get a word acoustics from that word in Greek. Not upon sight or knowledge, a firmly relying confidence in which we hear from God in his word. In his word. Hear from God in his word. Now my pages are sticking together. El peace is another one. El peace. Expectation of something future. A dearly cherished, a dearly cherished, and apparently well-grounded expectation, prospect of some desired good. That's El Peace. It is a hope. We have the word pistis, where we get the word pytho, which is a verb, pythane. To, be, to be persuaded. To be persuaded by words. Oracle. By words or a statement. To be persuaded by a statement. Now remember, in years gone by, they were confidence men. Confidence men. They would go out and they were charlatans. Uh, it, well, let's name a famous charlatan. Charles Taze Russell was one. Joseph Smith was a famous charlatan. And by words, these were confidence men, and by words they would convince people that everything was okay, that just follow them or whatever, 
Now, Charles T. Russell sold miracle wheat and different things. You know, he was a confidence man before he ever became a, what, a, what we might call a Bible miss student. <laughs> he, was a, he was not a student of the Bible. He was a, they wanted, he wanted to be called teacher. And then look at Muhammad. What a tremendous confidence man Muhammad was in history. A confidence man. Uh, there are movies made out by these confidence men. The Flim Flam Man, you know, all of this. Uh, and these people would come into your home and sell you things a long time ago. They would sell vacuum cleaner salesmen, all kinds of stuff. And they would come into your home with a vacuum cleaner and they would throw a bunch of dirt on your carpet. And then pick it up with their vacuum cleaner. So you'll see how good that is. It was not any better than any other vacuum cleaner. The one you had maybe was just as good as that or maybe even better than the one that they had. To be persuaded and won by words and influence. To be taken by faith and confidence and persuasion to the point of complete commitment. A trustworthy word. Just think of how many people have gone to hell following Joseph Smith to this day. Think about how many men have gone to hell following Muhammad. The Pope. The Pope. Look at that. They have a different gospel, don't they? They have a different hell or no hell. I did one here. Did you hear the different gospel and a different hell? The one I preached on that. They have a different gospel and a different hell. And it is, it is, a, it is a false confidence and it's a false faith. Now, apesis is the word that means no faith. Apesis, that means unfaithful or no faith at all. You were asking me questions about some of these people that the Lord shall say, you know, I never knew you one of these days. Oh, we did this in your name, we did that in your name. Why? Catholics cast out demons, don't they? Don't they have these exorcisms and things? But yet their, their statement of faith is not valid. This is what we call invalid faith. Now, let's look at some valid faith in the Bible. These, this, this is valid. This is real faith. Hebrews 11th chapter. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for. Remember? The assurance of things hoped for. You really believe that's going to happen. How many people every year blow themselves up from the confidence man, Muhammad, that when they die, they're going to have 72 virgins waiting on them hand and foot. They don't have to go to hell. According to, Mo to Muhammad, everybody has to go to hell. All, all Muslims have to go to hell for a while to be purified. That's a different hell too, isn't it? Hell does not purify. Purgatory does not purify you till you come to the state of perfection and then you get to go to heaven. Either you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ that God sent forth his son in the fullness of time made of a woman made under the law just like the Bible said he would or you don't. That's valid faith. That's true faith. And the Bible has some very unusual characters that were pillars of faith. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen, for it by men of old gained approval. And then it goes on down here in the 11th chapter, of the, what we call the faith chapter of the Bible, telling all the different ones. By faith, we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God that God created spoke the things into existence but the things that, that came into existence we have the we have the term ex nihilo 
that God created everything out of nothing. No, he didn't create it out of nothing. He created it from himself. Everything that you see in this world and all the universe came from the person of God. He is the origin of all things. He created things that we see that are visible out of things not seen. And the things not seen were in him. That's why he can redeem everything back to us. He's double related to the earth, isn't he? It came from him. And then after he became flesh in John 1, 14, then he was doubly related to the earth. The whole book of Ruth tells us about kinsman redeemer, the Goel, our kinsman redeemer. By faith we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God and that what is seen was not made out of things which are visible. They didn't say it out of nothing, did it? Ex nihilo, that was a Catholic church father that said this ex nihilo business. By faith, Abel offered to God a better sacrifice. Look at that. Now let's go back in the Old Testament to the book of Joshua the second chapter and let's see a unlikely pillar of faith an unlikely pillar of faith Joshua the second chapter I had this marked Joshua, the seventh chapter, second chapter. And uh, still haven't got to it. Joshua, chapter two. Now, in the second chapter of the book of Joshua, we have Joshua. By the way, what does Joshua mean? In the New Testament, what's the name for Joshua? Jesus. Jesus. Joshua was a type of Christ, wasn't he? Joshua was one of the only two men that went into the promised land that lived, that, that came from Egypt. Joshua and Caleb. Now Joshua the son of Nun sent two men as spies secretly from Shittim saying go view the land especially Jericho, Jericho, the land of palm trees. So they went and they came into the house of a harlot. A harlot? What in the world has a harlot got to do with this business? The house of a harlot. A harlot. Now, in the 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews, it tells us that this harlot was a very faithful pillar of faith. It doesn't say too much about her. Her name was Rahab. Rahab. That was her name, Rahab. Whose name was Rahab and lodged there. And it was told to the king of Jericho, saying, Behold, men from the sons of Israel have come here tonight to search out the land. And the king of Jericho sent word to Rahab. Rahab. This must have been really a famous courtesan of some sort. Remember, we have another pillar of faith in the New Testament that was a prostitute. What was her name? Mary Magdalene. She was a famous prostitute. She was very rich. Now this prostitute must have been very famous and very rich. And this is a long time ago. I've been there. You, you've been there also. And by the way, those, wall, those walls did not fall down. As you would think they fell down. The walls of Jericho did not fall down. You know what happened to the walls of Jericho? 
the ground swallowed them up whole, just like that. That's the great miracle. Remember, Joshua walked around that city seven times, and then he blew the trumpets and the shouted and all of this, and the walls of Jericho fell down. They did not crumble and fall down. Did you see this, what I'm talking about? They fell down. They went down in the ground. They just swallowed. The yeah, ground swallowed still, the walls of Jericho yeah. up. Yeah, they're still all there. All there. The walls are still there. But the ground swallowed the walls up. Woof. Just like that. Like they were put on an elevator. Weep. Down they went. Did you see that, Jim? Yes, I saw that. That's true, and it's yeah, Sharon. Yeah, they're, they're, they're right there. Where they excavated, and it just it looks like a retaining wall. Everything's still It's just place. the wall is still there. Did you know that? I, yeah, I yeah. The walls of Jericho just were swallowed up. Zip. They just fell down level. And they marched into the city. The walls were just swallowed up. And uh, whose name was Rahab and lodged there. And it was told to the king of Jericho, and behold, men from the sons of Israel have come here tonight to search out the land. The king of Jericho sent word to Rahab, saying, Bring out the men who have come to you, who have entered your home or your house, for they have come to search out the land. Now let's see what the woman did. You know, most prostitutes are liars. Did you know that? They're real good liars. Because they're telling you that they love you and all this kind of stuff, in which they do not love you. They love your money. This woman was real good at that. This woman uh, uh, there in, in near Galilee, Mary Magdalene, was a courtesan. Now, let me tell you a little bit about these ancient courtesans. These ancient courtesans were were very educated women. They were beautiful. They were educated in making love, of course. You know, we think about harlots as their lovers. Yes, they did that. But they were musicians, and they were great vocalists. They could sing. And in every way they entertained. You've heard of the geisha girls of Japan. They were courtesans. They were very beautiful. They were well-dressed and they were well educated in in musical instruments and in singing that's what this was okay this is an unlikely pillar of faith right here i'm telling you two of them we see one in the old testament we see one in the new testament but the woman had taken the two men and hidden them there and she said yes the men came to me but I did not know where they were from. She's lying. This is part of her job, too. <laughs> She's still lying. But now something is different. And it came about when it was time to shut the gate at dark that the men went out, and I do not know where the men went. Pursue them quickly, or you will overtake them. She's lying. She's doing her job. For she had brought them up to the roof and hidden them in the stalks of flax which she had laid in order to, on the roof. So the men pursued them on the road to the Jordan, to the fords, and as soon as those who were pursuing them had gone out, they shut the gate. Gates were very important. That's why they had the walls around. This kept criminals out and robbers and things. Now before they had laid down, she came up to them on the roof and she said to them, I know that the Lord has given you the land. What's that mean? By faith. God was touching this woman's heart. This heartless heart. For some reason, God loved at least two women that were harlots in the Bible. Mary Magdalene and Ruth. It's given you the land, and that the terror of you has fallen on us. And all the inhabitants of the land have melted away before you. Now, this hadn't happened. 
had it. But she believed that God would do this. She, the Spirit of God had convicted her of sin, righteousness, and judgment to come, had he not? For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the, the Sea of Reeds, is actually what it was, the Sea of Reeds. It does not say Red Sea in the Hebrew. It's Sea of Reeds. And that Sea of Reeds was a, a deep enough place to, to ground people. And this is what happened. When Israel walked over across the Sea of Reeds and dry ground, this is like quicksand, people. It's a miracle that they went to this quicksand. This is really a very m marshy area. And then Pharaoh's army went through after Israel went through on dry ground and the ground wasn't dry anymore. It was quicksand. And their wheels stuck. And then the water that was standing up like, like, like jello turned to water again. And they drowned. And they were stuck in their heavy armor and in their, their, their horses, their chariots, and all the men drowned in that. I know that the Lord has given you the land and that the terror is falling upon us. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea, but it's Reed Sea, the Sea of Reeds, before you when you came out of Egypt. And what you did to the two kings of the Amorites uh, that were beyond Jordan and to Sihon and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. Remember, Og was a great big guy. He's a Nephilim. He was, what, ten foot tall. A giant. And when we heard it, our hearts melted, and no courage remained in any man any longer because of you, for the Lord your God, he is the God of heaven above and on earth beneath. Now therefore please swear to me by the Lord, since I have dealt kindly with you, that you will also deal kindly with my father's household, and give me a pledge of truth. And spare my father and my mother and my brothers and my sisters with all who belong to them and to deliver our lives from the, this death that's going to happen. So the man said to her, Our life for yours if you do not tell this business of ours. And it shall come about when the Lord gives us the land that we will deal kindly and faithful with you. Now this is the promise to Rahab, Rahab. Then she let them down by rope through the window for her house was on the city wall so that she was living on the wall. And she said to them, Go to the hill country lest the pursuers happen upon you and hide yourselves there for three days until the pursuers return then after you may go on your way. And the men said to her, We shall be free from this oath to which you have made a swear, unless when we come into the land you tie this cord of scarlet thread in the window through which you let us down and gather to yourselves into the house your father and your mother and your brothers and all your father's household and it shall come about that anyone who goes out of the doors of your house into the street his blood shall be upon his own head and we shall be free but anyone who is with you in his house his blood shall be on our head if a hand is laid upon him but if you tell this business of ours then we shall be free from the oath which we have made, you have made us swear. Now what is the oath? You remember what that means? God made an oath to Abraham. God fenced himself in. You're fenced in. I'm in the fence. If you do what I tell you by faith, she would do it, wouldn't she? By faith, she would do and stay in the house if 
you were there, Sharon, Ron, Chris. If I was there, I would have run right then and taken off into the hills. But he told her, just, lay, just put a scarlet thread down the wall. That's all you have to do. And that's going to protect you in this house. That scarlet thread. And of course we know that scarlet thread is faith. There was a great preacher preached one time the scarlet thread to the Bible. I preached uh, for 24 hours one time without stopping. And I preached the scarlet thread to the Bible. We went back to Genesis 3.15, the promise of the woman. The promise of the woman. This woman here is the one that, this, this woman there in Genesis 3.15 is the one that ate the fruit off the tree and ate the tree. As far as I can tell, she ate the whole thing. A pillar of faith. To so the woman, we're going to have the Messiah child. To so the woman, we're going to have the Messiah child. And guess who the one of the women that's in the faith line that through her will be the Messiah come into this world, this prostitute. This prostitute, through her womb, would come a child that would be in that line of faith. We'll see that. Unlikely pillars of faith. Unlikely pillars of faith. Eve or Isha in a garden the one that actually was the first sinner <laughs> and seduced her husband into taking that. He, she did. She seduced her husband into eating that. Just here, come here and take this. But he knew better, didn't he? He knew better. And they departed and came to the hill country and remained there for three days. And the pursuers returned and now the pursuers had sought them all along the road but had not found them. Then the two men returned and came down from the hill country and crossed over and came to Joshua, the son of Nun, and they related to him all that had happened to them. This is Joshua and Caleb now, or the two men that, not Joshua and Caleb, but the two men that Joshua had sent out. And they said to Joshua, Surely the Lord has given all this land to our hands. And all the inhabitants of the land moreover have melted away before us. They have melted away before us. The, uh, the faith line is unusual. Let's go to Matthew, the first chapter. Matthew chapter 1. Katamathion, Gospel according to Matthew. Matthew chapter 1. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. To Abraham was born Isaac, Yitchik. And that boy is a pillar of faith, isn't he? One of the pillars of faith, but what did he do? This unlikely pillar of faith wanted to bless the wrong son, and he knew he was the wrong son. And what did God do to him to get his promise brought through? Blinded him. And then he used his wife, Rebecca, to take and put Jacob in the forefront because Jacob was supposed to be the man of faith. To Isaac, Jacob, didn't say Esau did it. And to Jacob, Judah, and his brothers. Judah. Judah. What kind of a person was Judah, this pillar of faith? <laughs> what kind of a person was Judah? You remember? What did he do? He married a uh, heathen, a pagan. And he had these boys by this pagan. Well, God looked over those boys and killed two out of the three of them, didn't he? They were rotten rats. They were pagans. They were God-haters. And yet, God used Judah. Let's go all the way back to the book 
of Genesis. Genesis, the book of beginnings, Genesis. Go all the way back to the book of Genesis. We have to go look at these little stories, these little nuggets, these little what we call scarlet threads. Unlikely pillars of faith. Gather together in here, and now Jacob's dying. O sons of Jacob. Oh, listen to Israel, your father. Now, why does he use the name Israel? Why does Jacob use the name Israel? How did he get that name? What? God named him that. Why did he name him that? Because the pre-incarnate Christ wrestled with him there at the brook Jagabuk. I've been there. You've been there? Yeah, that was over there in Jordan. So that's taboo country. I got to go on all these places because I was not on a, a tour. I was on archaeological dig where we get to go where we get shot at. <laughs> and missed, hopefully. You know, Sir Winston Churchill said this very unusual statement that I got, and I know what he meant because I'd have that. Marilyn, do I have bullet holes in me? Do I have bullet holes in me? Yeah. Yes. Now, it's real nice. <laughs> when you, He said it's really vigorating and exhilarating when you get shot at and missed. <laughs> he said it is extremely vigorating and exhilarating in spirit when you're being in the line of fire, but they missed you without effect. And that line of fire without effect. I can do without it a lot. I can do without it. Well, <clears throat> unlikely pillars of faith. Let's look at this unlikely pillar of faith. And hear me, O sons of Jacob, and listen to Israel, because he contended, it means to contend or wrestle with God. El is God, Isra on the front of that, it means to wrestle or contend. The man who contended with God and prevailed. So God called him Israel. Now he goes on down here and he talks about Reuben, his firstborn, beginning of his strength and his preeminent and dignity and preeminent and power. You're uncontrolled as water. You defiled your father's bed. In other words, he slept with his father's wife. He uncovered his father's nakedness. He slept with his father's wife. <coughs> and then he talks about Levi. Levi. The sons of Levi are who? The priest. What does, you know that the sons of Levi had no inheritance in the land? These are pillars of faith and orthodoxy we might say. <coughs> Simeon and Levi. Simeon means the one who hears. Boy. Simon Peter. Simeon was his name. And Levi means joined. Our brothers and their swords are implements of Hamas, is what it says. Hamas means violence. You know, the, the, the political group over there, Hamas, that's violence. Okay? Let my soul not enter into your counsel, he says. Let my glory be united. Let not my glory be united with your assembly, and yet they're going to be the priests of Israel. Think about this. And why did they do this? Because of Dinah, their sister. Dinah, mean, that's a feminine word for Dan, which means judge. There at Shechem, that boy wanted that girl for his wife so much, he was felt hook, line, and sinker in love with her, and took on her religion as his religion, and he was circumcised and had everybody in the town circumcised. They converted. And Simeon and Levi murdered them all and took everything they had. And Jacob said, you will not have an inheritance in that land. 
and Levi didn't, even though God used them as his priest. Boy, he does some unusual things. God does some unusual things, doesn't he? Called me to preach. That's weird. <clears throat> because of your anger, you slew men. And in herself, well, they lamed animals. Cursed be their anger, for it is fierce. And their wrath, for it is cruel. I will disperse them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. Now he comes down to verse number 8. This is very important. This is another weird thing. This is really weird. God does, you know, he made the porcupine, didn't he? He made a skunk. A skunk is really pretty cute little animal, isn't it? And a porcupine, that's quite an animal. I don't know how porcupines ever mate. You know, there's all these <laughs> porcupine quills. But they manage. <laughs> They're something. Well, look in here. Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He, he crouches down. He lies down as a lion. As a lion, he, who dares to rise him up? We know that in the wars in um, <clears throat> what we call the Canaanite Wars, which you can read about in, 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 the, in the book of Jasher. Jasher, Jasher. I couldn't think of it in, he, in English. I had to, ha, safer, yashur. <laughs> the book of Jasher. He was one of the tr most tremendous, powerful warriors that fought. Jacob was even a great warrior, even at his age. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until Shiloh comes. To him shall be the obedience of the peoples. He ties his foal to the vine, his donkey's coat to the choice vine. He wishes his garments, he washes his garments in wine. Revelation. his robes in the blood of grapes, and his eyes are dark from wine, and his teeth white from milk. Who's that? That's Jesus. Got back over here into Matthew. Unlikely pillars of faith. Is this, in, un, this is interesting. <clears throat> The book of the genealogy, the family history of the son of David, Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was born Isaac, and Isaac Jacob, and to Jacob Judah and his brothers. And to Judah was born Perez and Zerah by Tamar. Now it picks out Perez as the line of faith. Now how did this happen? As I said, Judah married pagans. And he had three sons by these pagans. And God killed two of them, and they were, they were married to Tamar. Tamar was a, a beautiful woman. Her name means palm tree. She was statuesque and beautiful woman. And she married one of the sons, and uh, God killed him. She married to another son, and God killed him. And Judah was afraid to give her to his other son because God might kill him. And he promised to give her so that the son brother could raise up seed to the fallen dead son. This is the line of faith, people. This is the line of faith. All right, now, I wouldn't have written this in my book. But God did. Because you and I are this type of people. And I don't mean to insult any of you out there, but you're all sinners. Just like me. Okay? We are, we are sinners. That's it. <clears throat> the Judah were born Perez and Zerah. 
And then it says Perez was born Hezron. Now, Perez was a product of Judah through Tamar. Tamar is Judah's daughter-in-law. God does some unusual things with his pillars of orthodoxy and faith. Tamar was a real, she was a rare, real heroine. She was. She was married by faith to this pagan. And then this other pagan, God killed him, both of these boys. But she was looking to Judah, not them. Because something special is going to come through this family. She believes that. Well, <clears throat> we didn't have welfare. We didn't have a food stamps or anything back then, did we? And the only hope that a woman had was to have children and to have children enough where she would have sons to where one of them would take care of her when her husband died or she got old. That was the only way that she's going to stay alive when she gets old. They didn't have, health, they didn't have rest homes and health care or anything like that. They didn't have Medi-Cal, Medicaid or anything. She wants to have a child. This is what every Jewish woman wants to have as a child. This is her salvation, so to speak. Well, Judah's lying to her. And she knows what kind of a man Judah is. Judah is a whoremonger. He is. He's a whoremonger. And so she dresses up like a prostitute. And she goes out and sits by the road. And this prostitute was a pagan prostitute that would sit on the side of the road near a temple, near a pagan temple, and they would go out and they would sell themselves and take the money back and put it in the temple. That's what they did. They would... In different places in, in Europe, they would go, they'd have temple prostitutes that would wear an ankle bracelet, and they would go into the city, and if anybody wanted to buy their services, they would give them that bracelet, and they would come and redeem it in the temple, in the temple. And all that money would go into the temple. Paganism. Paganism has used prostitution many times in the history of the world and mankind. Well, Judah is going to go shear sheep and go meet with his sons. But in the meanwhile, he sees this woman. Now, I'm going to tell you about this woman. Some of these prostitutes may have been very ugly. <laughs> <laughs> they covered themselves all up. They couldn't, see, they couldn't see their face. They had a veil on their face. Isn't it a funny thing that Muhammad wants to veil his women? Now, just think about that for a while. Well, she was veiled. And he comes by there and sees this woman. He says, well, there's, there's what I need today. And so he tells her, how much would you charge me to lay one down with you for a while. She said, what do you give me? Oh, I'll give you a, a real nice fat kid, a goat, a lamb, or whatever, you know. And she said, okay, but what are you going to give me? When you leave from here, I have no recourse at all. How can I know that you're going to pay me? Well, he said, I'll give you my signet ring and my belt that has my genealogy on, on my staff that has my genealogy and my family name and all that. So he leaves all that with her. And he does his thing and goes away. In the meanwhile, the story goes around that Tamar has gotten pregnant somehow. 
and he did not give his son to her, so how did she get pregnant? So now, you know what he's going to do to her? He's going to burn her alive. He's going to burn her. That was one of the, of the ways they executed people in Israel. They did it by strangling. They would strangle them. They would, but first of all, they'd take them out where everybody throws their refuse, all of their toilet. It's a cesspool. They take them out there and set them down in a cesspool on one side and the other, and they would take a rope and, or a sash and put it around their neck, and they would one on one side and one on the other, and they had have, have hands behind them, and they would strangle them and then just leave them there. Or they would take and behead them. Or they would take and burn them. Now, how they burned them was not the way you would think they burned them. They would take like a rope and drench it in some type of petroleum or olive oil or something that burned. They crammed this thing down their throat and then set the thing on fire. In the meanwhile, they would hold their hands out like this and just let them suffocate and burn. That's what he was going to do to her. He was vicious in his anger because this woman got pregnant. But he should have given her to his son, and he lied to her. Well, when it came time for the trial to take place, he said, what evidence? Who, who, who is the father of this child? And she said, well, the guy that owns this belt and this staff and this signet ring. And what did he say? You are more righteous than I am. She was. She was more righteous than him, wasn't she? Now, he never slept with her or took her as his wife ever again. Never. But that child, she had twin sons, like Jacob and Esau. She had twin sons, and God chose Perez and Hezron. And Hezron Ram, and Ram was born Abinadab, and to Abinadab was born Nashon, and to Nashon was born Salmon. Here we go again to this unlikely pillar of faith. Now, there are two genealogies of Jesus, one through Mary, and this one is through Joseph. But we find out that it changes just a little bit. Which son of David's? One of them was cursed. And this line puts that, that son in there. That's the one that Jacob or that Joseph came from. But then in, in Luke, the third chapter, we have the other son of David. But all of them come down. That was a real physical lineage. This is a royal lineage here. And Ram was born Abinadab, and to Abinadab was born Nashon, and to Nashon and Salmon. And to Salmon was born Boaz by Rahab, the harlot. And Rahab is a infidel, isn't she, so to speak? She is a pagan, but God grafted into pagans. Why, Paul the Apostle says in the New Testament, he said, we're all the same, aren't we? Is neither Jew nor Greek. Jesus is related to all of us, isn't he? Even through Rahab. These were that cursed Canaanite people. The land, the people in the land of Canaan, they were the cursed ones. But God reached the soul of this woman, Rahab, the harlot. And she was a harlot. She wasn't a good guy or a good woman. Born Boaz by Rahab. And Boaz was born Obed by who? Ruth. Now let's go back and look at this story. Another story of unlikely pillars of faith. Remember who Lot was? The New Testament said that he vexed his righteous soul. This is one of his descendants. Ruth the Moabitess. Ammon and Moab. That was the two sons by the two daughters of Lot. He had uh, children by his two daughters. One 
was Moab and the other was Ammon. And both of these girls got him drunk and then went and slept with him and got pregnant and they had these two children and then we have the Ammonites and the what? The Moabites. Moab means what? Water from the Father, literally. Incest. Water from the Father. That's what Moab means. Ruth the Moabitess. Look at this. A prostitute, now another basically woman that, that this these are her these are the line of faith, all right. They're all Shemites, but unlikely pillars of faith. But what did Ruth say? Remember what Ruth said? When her, when her husband died, she told Naomi what? My God, will be your God. my God will be your God. My family will be my land will be yours. My family will be yours. I will be, do that. And she was quite a seductress, wasn't she? Ruth. Remember Boaz? She was out there. He was gleaning in this field. And that's over there, the field where, where Jesus was born in Bethlehem. This is the place. Out there in that field. She was out gleaning in that day, and he said, oh, let her have more. She must have been a pretty woman, this Ruth. And let her have more, and then she goes, and she goes down and lays down beside Boaz. At his feet. <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. But she goes and lays down by him, and what does she do? She covers herself. Yeah. She said, will you marry me? Will you marry me? And uh, <clears throat> he was seduced. <laughs> and he went and, and, and she said, well, I'm your relative, but there's one closer than me, so you have to go ask him for permission to marry me. And they did, and now we have this. And Boaz was born Obed and by Ruth, and Obed was born Jesse. And to Jesse was born David, the king, and now we have the city of David there, so to speak, this Bethlehem, the house of David. Ignored all this. And David's grandmother and great-grandmother are pagans. But they have become believers, haven't they? Pillars of faith. And the David was born Solomon by whom had been the wife of Uriah, Bathsheba. Look at that situation. Boy! God, and, and Solomon was one of the biggest pagans in the land of Israel, wasn't he, in all reality. Through his life he became a drunk and a drug addict, and he had a thousand and one wives. Is that right, thousand and one? He had, he had 700 and 300, that makes 1,000. And then what was, who was the other one? The Queen of Sheba. And she had a child by him also. We see all of these pillars of faith. Pillars of faith. All the way down to here in verse number 12. And after the deportation to Babylon, to Jeconiah was born Sheatel, and to Sheatel was born Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel was born Abihud. Now Zerubbabel, you know what Zerubbabel means? Seed of Babylon. They were in Babylon. Seed of Babylon. That's what, that's what Zerubbabel means. Born in Babylon or seed of Babylon born. Eachem, Eliakim, Azor, Azor was born Zadok, Zadok was born Akim, Akim, Elihud, and to Elihud was born Eliezer, and to Eliezer was born Mathan, and to Mathan was born, <coughs> and to Mathan was born Jacob, and to Jacob was born Joseph, the husband of Mary, by whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. Now in Luke, the third chapter, we have the same story. 
We have the same story. Now this is Mary's genealogy here. And Mary, when Mary was, uh, Mary's father adopted Eli, the son of Eli that is, that was Mary's father, Eli adopted Joseph as his son and gave him the family name. And if you go all the way down to verse number 31, it said, The son of Melia and the son of Mina, the son of Mathatha, and the son of Nathan, the son of David. So we go through Nathan. We go through Nathan. And the son of Jesse, the son of Obed. You see, we, we go through Nathan here. Because the other sons were cursed. We see all of this line of faith. Are you in the line of faith? Are you? Are you an unlikely pillar of faith in your world today? Like these are? We're all sinners, aren't we? We're all sinners. But are you an unlikely pillar of faith in your time? How is God going to use you for his honor and glory today? Have you got a job to do? Have you got memories to leave? Have you got children to lead to the Lord? Have you got grandchildren that you're going to do the best you can with leading them to the Lord? There's an old story, you can lead a horse by water, but you can't make him drink. And that's true. But you can salt his grain and make him thirsty a little bit. That's the rest of the story there. What part are you going to play in this God's eternal purpose? Are you going to be one of those unlikely pillars of faith in your family? My life is the most messed up life that a person could possibly ever have. I'm a displaced Indian. My family were displaced from the original Indian territories where they came from, from Georgia, Tennessee, the Dakotas, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Tennessee, Alabama, and they were forced into, forced marched into Indian territory, which became Oklahoma. It became so terrible in Oklahoma that some of the Indians escaped. The Cherokee side of my family never signed the Dawes Act. Ever. They were lands were taken from them, they were killed. My great grandfather, John Wilburn, was shot trespassing on his own land near Walters, Oklahoma. Because they had taken his land, he would not sign the Dawes Act. He said, I'm not signing another treaty. The last treaty said, as long as the sky would shine, it would rain, and the waters would run, and the grass would grow, the, that, that treaty was good. I have not. I'm not going to change it. So they said, well, Mr. Wilburn, your land doesn't belong to you anymore. And when he drove his cattle and goats and things into his pasture, they shot him down as a trespasser. Well, my, land, my family <clears throat> began to migrate to California with Sam Paul's sister, Sippy, or Mississippi, or Sipia, whatever you want to call her. She came out here near Grainfield, and her daughter was out here had a farm. They came out here to be mistaken for white oakies so they could own land. My family, when they hit California, they bought an acre of ground right off of the what was called the old Edison Strip. Right out there in that clay ground, clay hard as rock. They bought a little acre of ground and put a shack on it made up out of boards that floated down the canal. Family were poor. I know what it is to be hungry. I know what it is to have a, a stomach hurting and swelling because of hunger. I can't stand to see an animal hungry or any, anybody. I can't stand to see that because I know what it's like. My mother married my father. My father went to war with Pat and he came back with post-traumatic stress disorder so bad that he was nothing but a, but a robber and a thief. Betty Davis was his girlfriend, running around on my mother all the time. Down in Hollywood, 
supporting Bob Wills and these Texas Playboys because he was one of them and Bill Woods and all of them down there. He was taking care of all of them by robbing liquor stores and stealing cars. And he was shot in 1949 robbing a liquor store. Then my dad and mother took up with several other men and then one very, the one that raised me was Dale Otto Remling, a world-class confidence man and uh, criminal except that he taught me everything that I know in the good. And he did say this, Jimmy, don't do what I do. Just do what I teach you. That he told me. Later in life, he had two sons, and both of them were worthless. And they asked him, what did you ever do with your life? Uh, Uncle Dale or whatever, you know. What did you ever do? He said, I raised Jimmy. That was his one thing that he thought that he did right. Well, he did. I worshipped the ground he'd walked on. I sure didn't want to follow in his pathway that way. But he was a writer. He could sing like a, a cross between Frankie Lane and, and Mar Marty Robbins. He could dance like Fred Astaire. And any woman that ever met him never forgot him. Am I telling the truth, Marilyn? Yes. Every one. I mean, if they were five years old, they remembered him. Even the Indian lady. Even the Indians up there remembered him. The Indian girls. <laughs> well, that's my lineage back there to destruction and drunkenness and alcoholism. You read the book Shadow and Indian Star and you'll find out what where I came from. They were some great men. Matter of fact, all of them were great, whether they were whatever, alcoholics or whatever, they did something in this world. John Paul Jones, the father of American Navy, that was my great uncle, far removed. The white man in my family, that Scotsman. Rand and Paul, Rand, jo Rand Paul and Ron Paul. That's all from that side of the family and the real Rooster Cogburn and the Billy the Kid and Lincoln County War. Boy, you come from this kind of stuff. And that's what we call the grace of God. I remember Brother Madden one time, I was in going to the seminary and Brother Madden and I went all over the Middle East together. <clears throat> and uh, we were back at the seminary and I was there one morning and they had these books, these Newsweek books and things there. And one of them had my dad on the front page. And I said, that's my dad right there. He looked at me and he looked at that book. And he said, your real dad was killed right down here in Long Beach at that liquor store, robbing the liquor store, and this is your dad? The one that raised you right here? He said, boy, you're a work of grace. <laughs> <laughs> We're all works of grace, people. We're all unlikely pillars of faith in all reality. We are. That's the story. Unlikely pillars of faith. Unlikely believers. Boy, it's amazing that God can save any of us in it. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, I pray that you use this message to go out and to touch people's lives, and I pray that it touch those here today. Father, thank you for the forgiveness you give us because I need it. I am one of those unlikely believers. I know that. Thank you for all the blessings you give us this very day. And bless these students that are here today with your word. In Jesus' name I pray.